But today's text is out of Matthew chapter 16, a passage of scripture that you have tucked away in your memory. Verse 13, if you if you don't have this memorized, every Sunday morning when you come in the door, if you look on the door, you can it, it'll help jog your memory. All right. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 13, the Bible said, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? The Son of Man? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, one of the prophets. And then he brought this thing down to be real personal. Because the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter what other men say. It's your opinion of Christ that matters. Isn't that right? Okay. And so he said, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. If you don't know what that means, Simon was Peter's name. Bar was son of, Jonah was his dad's name. So Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. I just thought I'd give you a little vacation Bible school lesson. And he said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Father, we thank you today for your word. Give us insight and wisdom as we study and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> this last few weeks, we've been looking at different aspects of the church. I am more convinced today than any other time in my years of ministry that it is the time for the church of the living God to stand up and be the church of the living God. We're going to close this series today by using this message that I have entitled the church in the gates of Hades. Jesus made this promise in Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, and I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The signifying words in this statement that Jesus made to Simon Peter is so amazing because they are just as real today as they were that day that Jesus brought forth a subject that had never previously been discussed from this perspective. Jesus signified in the statement to Simon Peter that there was going to be brought into existence, and you and I know that it the, the birthday of the church was on the day of Pentecost. There was no church prior to Pentecost. There was no church in the Old Testament. There was no church in the Gospels. The church did not come into existence until it was born on the day of Pentecost. So Jesus is talking about something that the disciples knew nothing about. Paul called it a mystery that the Old Testament prophets knew nothing about. So Jesus said to Simon Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed the statement that you just made to you. That is, men did not tell you this truth. This is a truth that only came from heaven. And then he said, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The indication here is that the church 
would be a, a, an organization, a move, a body of born-again believers that would be in constant battle with an enemy. You and I know that to be true because we have experienced it and we still are, aren't we? We, we still are, aren't we? If you aren't familiar with the battles that the enemy has sent your way, see me after church because you have some issues. But Jesus said this, in the end we win. In the end we win. He said that the church prevails. There are many, many, many denominations today. You, you know that if I have an axe to grind, and I have a bunch of axes to grind, but the primary axe that I grind most of the time from, from this pulpit or in any Bible study or in a conversation about church is denominationalism. I am totally and absolutely convinced that the greatest trick that Satan ever pulled on the, on the church of the living God is to divide us into denominations. Now, guys, we, we have issues. The world has issues with us. And they're confused. Because we only have one Bible. Now, we've got, you know, the um, Mormons have a little bit more in theirs, and the Catholicism have a, has a little bit more in theirs. But it's all the same Bible. This, the same scriptures that we have in the Bible that I preach out of are the same scriptures that's in all these other Bibles that just have a couple, three, four, five, six more books added to them. But here's the, here's the rub that the world don't understand. If you go to a Methodist church today, you're going to hear a Methodist sermon. And if you go to a Baptist church today, you're going to hear a Baptist sermon. And if you go to a Pentecostal church today, you're going to hear a Pentecostal sermon. And if you go to a Catholic church today, you're going to hear a Catholic sermon. And on and on and on and on. Here's the problem. We're all preaching out of the same book. And the, Pentecost, the Pentecostal church preaches a sermon that's diametrically opposed to the sermon that, that you would hear in a Baptist church. Or in a Methodist church. Here's the deal that the world can't understand, and this is it. We can't all be right. Is, is that true? We can't all be right, guys. I mean, if the Methodists are right, then I'm diametrically opposed to what they believe. You say, well, why would you say that? Because they believe a doctrine I don't believe in. That is the Arminianism that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow and saved today and lost tomorrow. And all the Pentecostal churches believe that too. And free will Baptists believe that also. Then you have denominations that believe in the doctrine of, of, of Calvinism that believes you're predestined for heaven or hell before you're ever born. And if that's true, then it's diametrically opposed to what I believe. Is there any wonder the world is confused outside about what we're doing in here? So I want to talk to you today about the church, and that's the reason that we've had this series. <clears throat> the church is called by many names in the Scriptures to designate its origin, its relationships, its responsibility, and its destiny. It's called the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, God's building, God's husbandry, God's temple, God's household of faith and the flock of Christ. 
It's called the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. A, we're called a peculiar people, a, a chosen nation, a royal priesthood, a purchased possession, the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the innumerable company of saints composed of every nation, tongue, and tribe, and station, and color. But most of all, the church is known in the scriptures as a body of born-again, baptized believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized in to one body, whether they be Jews or Greeks or slaves or free, we have been all made to drink into one Spirit. In other words, the church is made up of born-again believers, no matter what color or nationality, whether you are rich or poor, it doesn't matter. Whether you are, are smart or dumb, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you have honestly, totally accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Being saved by faith in Christ is what makes us a partaker of his divine nature. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these we may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. As members of his body, as members of this universal mystical body of Christ called the church, we are part of himself. The Bible says in John chapter 15, verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches who abides in me, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them in the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Child of God, listen, this book says that God is the vine, and you can do nothing apart from God. He is the God of eternity. Apart from him, there is nothing good going to happen. He is the God of heaven. He is the God of earth. He is the God of the church. Therefore, today, as we close out this series, we're going to talk about the church in the gates of Hades. There are some things we need to know. First of all, the church in the gates of Hades is a fixed church. Jesus made this statement in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And I also say that you are Peter, and on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The Bible doesn't leave us in the dark concerning who this rock is and what this rock is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 and verse 4 says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud or passed through the sea, and all drink of that spiritual drink, for they drink of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 and 11, For we are God's fellow workers. We are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. For I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one of us take heed how he builds on it. For there is no other foundation that anyone can lay other than which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter uh, 2 verse is 1 through 6. Peter makes this in no uncertain words. Tells us that Christ is the living stone. Therefore laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. 
coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built upon a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it is also contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Among the many figures and pictures of the church, both Peter and Paul used that of a building or a house. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27, he gave us this warning. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken to him as a wise man who builds his house on a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them would be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was the fall. Child of God, you don't have to worry about this world and the storms of this life beating down the church of the living God for it is founded on the rock and his name is Jesus. I like what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 11, verses 2, uh, Psalm chapter 112. All right, I'll get it right in a minute. My glasses are giving out my blind, my eye too went blind. I couldn't see what I was reading. He says, he will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Listen to what the psalmist is saying. Of all of these things that you're hearing, all of the things that you're hearing and seeing going on in the world around us, Satan is doing a real number on our world. And he's doing a real number on a bunch of believers. You're real quiet also. You know what? We look at the TV and we listen to the news and we read a paper, those of you who still get one. And we hear all of these things going on in the political arena, in the governmental arena, and in the social arena. And you would think the world is going to hell in a handbag. And you know what? More often than not, the people who are the most nervous, who are the most uncertain, are believers who sit in church every Sunday and hear some preacher preach that God is still God and he's still in control. I want to tell you again what the Bible said in Psalm 112, verse 7. We that are saved will not be afraid of evil tidings, evil sayings, evil news, even words, evil words. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I, it doesn't matter who's in, the, who's in the Oval Office and who isn't in the Oval Office. It doesn't matter who's in charge of North Korea or in charge of Russia or who's in charge of America or who's getting impeached in Alabama. Because God is still God. And that book from which I preach says that God puts kings on the throne and he takes them off when he's tired of them being there. So stop being like an ostrich. Get your head out of the sand and know that God's still God. Stand up and be somebody. 
The problem is too many of our churches today are, are, are fixed on something other than on God. Too many people are fixed on the pastor or some doctrine or some program or on some tradition or on something else. But when we as a church can get our focus on Jesus, then we'll start seeing that responsible Christianity is about serving Him and loving Him and being what He's called us to be. The church that's standing in the gates of Hades is a fixed church because they understand that it's founded on Jesus Christ and He's the rock that will not be moved. Second, the church... Standing in the gates of Hades is a fighting church. <laughs> Not like most Baptists. God help us. I'm telling you, if God's people could get together, about 75% of all the churches in this world would not even be in existence. Say, you're right, preacher. You say, well, why? Because, because, because we can't get along, we're going to start a new church. We fuss and fight and feud, and we decide, I'm, 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 not, going, I'm not going to church with that bunch of hypocrites. They're all crazy. And I'm sure, I'm sure not going to forgive them because they're wrong. Oh, oh, I know what I'll do. <laughs> I'll just go start me a new one. Now, all of you people that are holy as I am, come on, we're going to start a new church. And we'll all be holy together. And all these heathens over here in this church can't come. Because they're wrong. <laughs> and I'm right. Hello? So, just to make sure... We're going to call it new something. We're going to call it new love, new life, new beginnings, new covenant, new something. Well, if you're going to bring the same garbage in it that you've just been living in, you don't have to call it new, just call it same garbage church. That's not, Jesus. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He said, I say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Listen, Jesus is talking about a church that's not building some great defense or trying to hold our ground. He's talking about a church that is a militant church, a victorious church, a moving church, a vibrant church. He's talking about a church that's not afraid, that's not cowering down, but a, a church that has a combative character, aggressive for the cause of Christ, a church that is victorious, a church that is standing tall, a church that is carrying the name of Jesus, a church that can say, yes, God, you go and I'll follow. We're living in a time where we're fighting hell by the acre. Isn't that right? I talk to pastors and I talk to church leaders and I see people whose lives are being scarred with sin, beaten down by Satan, and all the while they're saying something stupid. Well, I preach we're just holding our own. <laughs> we haven't gained any, but thank God we hadn't lost any. That's a bunch of garbage. I, let me just, can I just be honest with you? That's a lie. I was born in hell, raised by the devil. We aren't just holding our own. You can't just hold your own as a church. Because if you do, you're going to become dead and stagnant. And when churches become dead and stagnant, they lose a vision. They have no excitement. They have no thrill. They have no expectancy. And when all the excitement and all the thrill and all the expectancy is gone, guess what we do? We start pointing our fingers at each other. But Jesus said the church is a battle zone. 
We, we need to understand that, that we are in a war. Don't be afraid, we win. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12 says, Put on the whole armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against the evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. When I look at the church and our modern-day Christianity today, I see a group of religious folks who Satan has taken our stinger away. We have a pretty good bark, but we don't have much of a bite left anymore. We're afraid, and we cower down. We get behind our stained glass windows, and we don't want anybody to knock on our door that they got a little old piece of paper rolled up in their hand because they scare us to death. I stand before you today on the authority of the Word of God to tell you that the church in the gates of Hades has been commissioned to be a fighting church, an overcoming church, and a victorious church. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 39 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? It's written, for, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things, in all of these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God who is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Child of God, our victory does not come by our striving to overcome. Our victory does not come for our, from our abstaining from evil things. Victory does not come from our holding out and holding on or even doing the very best we can. I'm proud to say today that our victory comes through the victor, and his name is Jesus. Glory to God. Now y'all making me hurry. The third thing, the church in the gates of hell is a fiery church. John the Baptist looked out over that crowd today in his day, and he said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Today, we're hearing much talk about the Spirit-filled life. We hear a lot of teaching about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But we don't hear a lot of people talking about the fire. The Bible has a lot to say about the fire. The Bible used the word fire 549 times in 506 verses throughout the Word of God. None of those verses are more familiar than in Acts chapter 2. Beginning in verse 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. There's no doubt that something new was happening that day. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was both audible and both visible. Acts chapter 2 verse 6 says, And when the sound occurred... The multitude that came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. If you go downstairs on Sunday night or Wednesday night, you'll know that this is not the same language Paul was talking about in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 
This language was a language that they didn't know, but they were speaking. And every man, what? Heard in his own language. They were speaking a real language. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't mumbling. It wasn't jumbo jumbo. It was a real language. And every man heard what? In his own language. Not since the Tower of Babel has anything so amazing taken place. God's Holy Spirit was reaching out and, and reversing the curse of the Tower of Babel, of separation and confusion. And through the Holy Spirit today, we can experience what? Unity and understanding. The antidote of apathy and indifference and lack of power in our churches today is not more organization and not more programs. It is not better music or even better motivational. It is not even the emotional sermons. The antidote is very simple. It is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The antidote to, to asking, the antidote is simply asking God to move in my life, personally and individually. Let me tell you what I, what I see as a problem. We want God to move in our church. We want power in our services. We want God to, to lift up our music. We want God to lift up our preaching. We want God to set us on fire. You know how he does it? One person at the time. You want a revival in this church, let it start in you. You want commitment in this church, let it start in you. You want outreach in this church, let it start in you. You want to see people baptized every Sunday, let it start in you. You have to be what God has called you to be, and I have to be what God's called me to be for us to be the church that God has ordained on this earth in this last days. The Holy Spirit desires to make us whole emotionally and socially and spiritually. But the problem is we want somebody else to do it. We want somebody else to do it. So if you're in the booth, I'm skipping those next four pages. Because <laughs> y'all made me out of time. This morning, instead of having to experience of life, of failure, and a future of everlasting torment, if you're here and you're not saved, I encourage you to invite Jesus Christ to come into your life, forgive you of your sins, and make you a Christian. But if you're already saved, you're the primary target of what we've been talking about for the last six weeks. If you want this church to be a church filled with an excitement, then you get excited. If you want to see people saved, then you get involved in talking to people about Christ. If you want to see people baptized, you lead them to Christ, you get to baptize them. Hello? You want to see our, our church filled to capacity, then you start inviting people. Meet them out front or pick them up at their house and bring them to church with you. You see, the truth of the matter is we want, we want our church to be at capacity. We want our church to be filled with power and anointing. We want our church to be happy and be filled with worship. We want our music to be hallelujah music. We want all of those things. We just don't want to contribute to it. I'm not talking about contribute your money. The Bible said before they gave their offering, they gave first of all themselves to the Lord. You want to know what kind of church we have? When you get home today, walk into the bathroom and take a long look in the mirror. And you'll see the church. 
you'll see the attitude of the church. You'll see the, the, the response of the church. You'll see the love of the church. You'll see the joy of the church. You'll see what our church really is when you look at the man or the woman in the mirror. So you're right, preacher. God, that hurt something like you, didn't it? Let's stand together. And happy Mother's Day to you. <laughs> I knew you was going to love today's sermon. I couldn't hardly wait to get to it. Ladies and gentlemen, God has a plan for this church. You know how I know it? Because He has a plan for you. He doesn't have a plan for this church apart from you. He put you here for a purpose. Now, here's my challenge. Find out what God put you here for and do about God's business in your life. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you'll make this your prayer, hold your hands up. Say it out loud with me, Father. Your word is true. I want to be a part of this church, of your church, of a church that is willing to stand in the gates of Hades and to be all that you've called us to be for your glory. I can do that because I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who loves me. In Jesus' name, amen. Whatever God's put on your